네, 안녕하세요. 오늘 국제정치학회 어, 회의를 하게 시작해 하게 되었는데 오늘 세, 오늘 국제학술회의의 주제는 2021 북한 문제 및 남북 관계 국제학술회입니다. 먼저 오늘 회의는 그 철저한 방역 수칙과 그에 따른 안전 조치를 어, 충분히 취하면서 진행되고 있다는 말씀 드리고요. 회의 진행하도록 하겠습니다. Uh, we have two presenters from uh, abroad. Uh, can you can you hear me very clearly? Yes. yes. Presenters from yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So let let us begin the panel two. Welcome to the panel two, which is entitled "The Future of the Korean Peace Process and the Regional Security Situation." Uh, for this panel, we have two presenters from. Uh, abroad, uh, one from China, one from Australia. Uh, the first presenter on this panel is the, uh, Dr. Li Nan, a senior, senior research fellow of the Institute of American Studies at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And the second presenter is Thomas Wilkins, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney. Uh, at the same time, he also serves as a senior fellow at the Japan Institute for International Affairs. Uh, the panel two is entitled The Future of the Korean Peace Process and the Regional Security, Security Situation. And uh, our first presenter, Dr. Lin An, will give us a presentation about uh, China's strategy toward the North Korean nuclear issue and the future of the China-North Korea relations, which is a very hot topic these days. Uh, so I think uh, uh, his presentation will touch upon the very crucial and interesting points. Uh, and the, our second presenter, uh, Thomas Wilkins, will give us a presentation about the uh, Indo-Pacific. The subtitle of his presentation is Concept and Regional Strategic Dynamics on the Korean Pe Peninsula. Also, uh, his presentation is going to raise many interesting issues given that the uh, U.S.-China strategic competition has unfolded in the, at the regional level as well. So I'm very much ex uh, looking forward to listening to both pr presentations. Why don't we start the uh, first uh, start with the first presenter, Dr. Li Nan. Uh, I would like to ask each of the presenters to uh, deliver your presentation maximum 20 minutes uh, so that we, our discussants will have enough time to discuss your presentations. And also, I hope to expect uh, we have some uh, audience on the floor. They will actively participate in the discussion later in this panel. So, Dr. Linan, why don't you start your presentation? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'd like to appreciate Professor Huang and Cass for having me here and uh, join the excellent discussion with current situation in Korean Peninsula. And uh, I have learned a lot from the seminar in the morning and uh, clearing my mind on the Biden administration uh, on Korean Peninsula. Uh, a policy. So I really I have to say I really miss Seoul. And uh, it, before the coronavirus, I can I, I go to uh, both Korea very often. But right now, one year and I have been now to uh, Korean Peninsula for a while. So I really miss uh, both Korea and especially Seoul. And uh, now I like to talk about the China policy toward uh, DPRK, North Korea. And I'm looking forward to hearing your comment and opinion. And firstly, firstly I'd like to talk about China's strategic interest on, on Korea. And uh, uh, I think China's strategic uh, interest in Korean Peninsula are to maintain a makeable relationship with both Korea and ensure a stable and nuclear-free peninsula. So the DPRK is China's neighbor, and the two countries have had long-standing relationship and uh, over the years, China have, has given strong political support and economy assistance to DPRK and uh, contributed to the political stability and economic development of the DPRK as reiterated in all China DPRK summit since 2018. So China also support DPRK effort to integrate into the international community and improve and eventually normalization, normalize 
relationship with the United States, Japan, European Union, uh, among the others. Also, China is a member of uh, NPT and fully support and advised by the NPT regime. China seriously concerned about DPRK nuclear program and does not wish for another nuclear state to emerge in neighboring country. And also China concerned the DPRK program, nuclear program might encourage Japan or other countries in the region to develop their own program. So nuclear proliferation and uh, advanced missile, missile compatibility in, in East Asia goes against China's security interest. And besides maintaining the UN sanction against DPRK, China continue to, continues to favor a step-by-step -step double trend process to advance denuclearization and a peaceful resolution of hostilities on Korean Peninsula. Additionally, China believes the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula will not happen in the short term. So China supports the multilateral approaches to address this issue. From China's view, pressure on DPRK should not be the only approach. Flexible concession and the full mutual implementation of agreement should be more important. In the long run, China also encourage, encourages DPRK to focus on economic development. To achieve this, China will increase the economic assistance and the cultural exchange like such as training the official and students about the, the market economy and introducing China experience on reform and open policy. Uh, so, so also I'd like to talk about uh, the China's views on the, the US DPRK uh, talk. So if a comprehensive agreement appears unlikely, so an interior in, in uh, deal can be reached by the United States and the DPRK. And ideally, the DPRK could promise to freeze its nuclear weapon and now to conduct uh, ICBM test and uh, stop the development of, of the medium and long range missile. So the United States, on the other hand, from China's perspective, could partially lift economic sanction and uh, or reversible sanction imposed on in, in DPRK. Well, at the same time, promise not to import high-tech offensive weapon into ROK. The next step uh, of negotiations would be carried out on the basis of effective implementation of such initial agreement. Only by uh, adhering to a step-by-step -step approach can the United States and the DPRK accumulate trust if denuclearization is not a realistic goal in the short term, the party should maintain a makeable atmosphere conducive to talk. The UN sanction on DPRP uh, encouraged the promotion of relations between the, the two Korea and encourage engaging in dialogue regarding uh, environmental, humanitarian, and uh, healthcare assistance with DPRK. So finally, multilateral approach should be also restarted. However, those uh, multilateral approaches should not just be repetition of the 60 party talks. First, the participation of the DPRK is required. And second, during the uh, multilateral dialogue, the DPRK's concerns should be con considered, avoiding uh, the untoward behavior of many parties votes, votes one party. And third, the role of the third party, like China, uh, ROK, Russia, and Japan, uh, should, be, should be emphasized and should be stressed, but they just do focus on this nuclear issue. So the unrelated issue should not be part of this talk. And this, uh, I think this is China's uh, thinking on the US DPRK talk in future on denuclearization. And uh, the next I want to talk about the DPRK strategic thinking on China. So I, I, uh, I used to go to North Korea. Uh, and uh, so this is my, my views, personal view on the DPRK, uh, the views on China. So, so 
right now DPRK has defied the international community on, on its nuclear program despite diplomatic and economic pressure. Many stress, many stress China's ties with DPRK and believe that the question of whether China is willing to use leverage on DPRK is the key to the solution of Korean uh, nuclear issue. However, the DPRK does not view its relationship with China as highly as many would think. And uh, second, the China's role in DPRK's strategic planning is not significant enough to change its behavior. Therefore, uh, it is argued asking China to use this leverage on DPRK would not solve the Korean nuclear issue. Uh, on the contrary, the more China put pressure on DPRK, the more likely the latter would resist due to China's, China's history in Korea. So Korean leader, North Korean leader, have been wary of China's influence in this country. So survival is a priority for any government, and without survival, anything else is meaningless. Before DPRK develops advanced nuclear capability, it needs China balance against the U.S. And the DPRK need to maintain reasonably good relationship with the rising China. And uh, so a lot of Korean in, in, in ROK are here say China is, uh, uh, North Korea is China's buffer zone. But in China, a lot, lot of people believe. So right now, uh, China is North Korea's buffer zone. And uh, so, however, DPRK's need for China does not mean that China can use leverage to direct DPRK's behavior. So the reason is that, firstly, DPRK needs China to counterbalance the U.S. threat, threat in its global level strategy, not to, help, not to help, have China help the U.S. undermine its own security. And uh, also, North, from North Korean perspective, China's role, especially China's vote on, in the U.N. for economic sanction, has proved to Chinese uh, North Korean. So China is not a reliable uh, partner. So uh, additionally, China's and Russia's unreliability would further motivate the DPRK to accelerate their, the developments of nuclear program. And uh, also the, 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 the leaders in North Korea still resist the Chinese political influence and although China's assistance indeed could improve North Korea, North DPRK economy and regime stability, it's not viewed by DPRK leader as the leverage that China can use to order DPRK around. And to many policymakers, sanction is still preferred solution, partially because uh, it's low cost of implementation and partially because they they distrust the DPRK. However, history shows that the sanction rarely changed the target state's behavior. To a society like DPRK that has already been closed and cut off from the international market, the long-term impact of sanction would be even more limited. So it is clear, uh, nearly impossible for DPRK to give up nuclear weapon at this stage due to its cons concerns of U.S. threat. So additionally, the sanctions have been used by DPRK propaganda to show to those um, DPRK, the people in DPRK, the Western aggression against uh, DPRK and uh, uh, blame the social pro uh, pro uh, problem on the West, so especially the U.S. So in, in other words, the sanction can be used by DPRK, the government, to strengthen their legitimacy as being the protector of the country and further control society for security reason. So even we can see very clear uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, so North Korea uh, government closed the border and uh, so the states control the society very strictly and they publish the law and uh, strict, strict, strict on the society. 
and we can see the this crisis make this uh, 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 regime more more uh, be supported by the people, and uh, so so the current approach of imposing sanction on DPRK uh, is is unlikely to su succeed from Chinese perspective and also from North Korean perspective. Uh, so the greater threat DPRK encounter, or the more isolated it is, the more it need China in short run to balance against the threat, but the more DPRK become, becomes a warrior of China's influence. And uh, also the third part, I like to talk about the common ground of DPRK and China right now. And, uh, uh, I, I list the three uh, role, the common ground of DPRK and China relationship. The first, uh, first is uh, China, the traditional friendship. And uh, so DPRK and China uh, have and developed a very close tie during the early 20th century. And uh, so it, um, um, in March 2018, uh, when Kim Jong-un uh, paid uh, an, an official visit to China. So uh, he was warmly re received by the uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping. And the two leaders held very candidate-friendly talk, stressing the need to inherit in and carry forward the tradition China DPRK friendship. So since that time, every time well, you can see the China DPRK official statement, they put the traditional friendship in the very uh, strong uh, word. And uh, so the, but I think it's very symbolic and showing uh, we have a more uh, comprehend, com operative space uh, in future. So the second part, second row, I would like to say the strategic partnership. That is, I think, very important. And uh, if, uh, if we read the, the the official statement um, published, released by the both government, they said, given the uh, sophisticated geopolitical environment in Northeast Asia, the historical traditional Beijing Pyongyang bonds and their realistic political and economic tie have been a focus of widespread attention and uh, have affected the way uh, other forces assess the regional situation. So despite the trail and hardship, the basic element of friendly China DPRK ties are solid and uh, unshakable. So we can see uh, from that part, uh, the China and the US, uh, China and DPRK facing the, the same challenge right now, and they want to uh, more be cooperative. And uh, uh, so they want to uh, uh, strategic coordination on how to uh, solve this challenge and facing this challenge. That is really important uh, right now for China and DPRK. It doesn't mean China and DPRK will go back to the lines uh, during the Korean War because uh, we, don't, we don't want to take this burden if there's a lies from China's perspective they will take a board and we have a responsibility. And uh, either North Korea, they, he, they don't want to take also the alliance board. But if we say the strategic partnership, if the Chinese threat is going up, so we can go in more strategic cooperation. And if the threat is going down, so maybe we can, we can have a, a flexible uh, policy adjustment. So this is a strategic partnership. And uh, the third, I say, the emotional ideological <laughs> partnership. And uh, North Korea and China always emphasized on the socialism on their own way. You know, China say uh, the socialism with Chinese characteristic, and North Korea say the socialism in, in the, their own way. So, uh, so that's why the ideological very, uh, very common. And uh, also, uh, right now, uh, North Korea and uh, China has the emotional support. So like since 2020, when uh, uh, Obama ministry, uh, 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 Trump administration 
criticized, harshly criticized on China. And uh, so it is DPRK who, uh, in the official statements, criticized Americans' criticism uh, uh, on Hong Kong issue and the Xinjiang issue. So currently, uh, North Korean representative in UN criticized the, the Western uh, uh, policy toward Xinjiang in the UN Human Rights Council. So you can see this emotional support very uh, uh, impressed Chinese people. So I think the emotional tie is really important for us. And uh, lastly, I talk about uh, briefly talk about the uncertainty of China and DPRK. And the uh, first one definitely denuclearization. And uh, uh, as I said, the, the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula is still a top issue agenda for China's policy toward the Korean Peninsula. So showing uh, in future probably this is still a gap between China and DPRK. So China still will push DPRK to uh, denuclear themselves in the in in the right time and uh, and when uh, uh, U.S. Uh, move forward and uh, get rid of those policy against DPRK and uh, China still will push DPRK to um, have a more uh, denuclearization policy toward to themselves and also uh, I think in from DPRK's perspective. They're still very concerned about China-U.S. relationship. Right now, they think China-U.S. relationship is is getting worse. So North Korea is really good at to get the advantage between the uh, conflict uh, among the great powers. So now they think this is a uh, this chance. But if China and the U.S. can have the serious and actual cooperation on the nuclear nuclear issue. And uh, so I still think China and the U.S. have a lot of common ground on the uh, Korean Peninsula. And uh, so if we can have the serious actual cooperation, then the China DPRK relationship will be will be going some a di different way, I think. And uh, as I said, on the strategic thinking, North Korean strategic thinking in China. So this is a problem. It is uncertain for our relationship. So I will stop here and uh, look forward to hearing comments and uh, opinion. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for your presentation. Uh, I also would like to thank you for finishing up your presentation in time. Uh, uh, during your short but insightful presentation, you raised many interesting points. I think uh, he gave us a very brief but insightful assessment of the current situation, mainly from the Chinese perspective. I think in particularly, when we talk about North Korea related issues, it is highly important for us to build a consensus about where we are. And then we can start a discussion from, now, uh, from that place. So in that regard, uh, Dr. Lee's uh, precise assessment about the current situation from the Chinese perspective is going to be very helpful for the later uh, discussion. And secondly, he also provided us uh, with a very sketch uh, illustration of the China's strategic thinking uh, toward the North Korea related issues. I think uh, he made it clear that the uh, uh, nuclear proliferation is not uh, in the interest of the, all the countries in the region. I think that is the bottom line we can discuss about the North Korea related issues. And also, I cannot agree with Dr. Lee Nan more when he says that the role of the third party is very important in dealing with the North Korea related issues. So uh, if time allows during the discussion session, I would like to take up this issue uh, one more time and then I would like to ask you specifically about the logical as well as the empirical foundation of the role of the uh, third parties in that in dealing with the North Korean issues. So uh, having said that, now I would like to move on to the second presenter, uh, Thomas Wilkins. Uh, Dr. Wilkins, uh, can you give us a presentation about 20 minutes? 
Yes, thank you very much, Chair, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to join you here in this um, Kate webinar. Um, thank you to uh, Ji Huan as well for organising everything. So I uh, found uh, I found um, Dr. Lin uh, presentation very, very interesting from the, the Chinese perspective, and I think I'll be giving you quite a different perspective here from the perhaps more anchored in the sort of the, the US allies and US alliance system approach here, but I think that's that's good to have both sides of the, de the, the, the debate. Also, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of move away from the very, very tight peninsula focus um, and look at the, 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 the Indo-Pacific concept in order to actually come back to the peninsula. So if you'll bear with me as I sort of go through this process, but many of the things I talk about are really um, refracted in um, the remarks that um, Professor Lee Nan uh, gave us. So um, there's three things I want to do um, in, um, you know, within the, the, the time constraints I have. I wanna just talk very briefly about um, what the Indo-Pacific concept is, because I think this really plays into the whole strategic dynamics of the region, um, including sort of the, the, the bigger picture in which the peninsula um, issue is, uh, is situated. Um, then I want to just touch briefly on, um, on uh, South Korean responses to the Indo-Pacific and how it sort of looks outwards towards um, the, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific powers, um, uh, particularly the US. I've done a little bit of work on this, but I, I will um, te not testify to being an expert on this, especially since we have so many South Korean experts in the room. And then I'll look, uh, as I said, come back <coughs> and, and look at um, the impact of, on uh, regional security dynamics and the Korean Peninsula security situation. So basically this, this Indo-Pacific concept is a, a major new framing device for regional strategic discourse, um, potentially re um, replacing the earlier Asia-Pacific descriptor. Um, but there's a lot of uh, lack of clarity on definitions, substance, implications of this concept. It raises all kinds of, of questions, um, questions appertaining to regionalism, strategic stability, regional architecture, it really um, encompasses everything. And perhaps most um, significantly, this Indo-Pacific concept has become a key driver for the regional strategies of what I would dub the Indo-Pacific powers, particularly the United States, Japan, Australia, India, and perhaps one or two others. But of course, the Indo-Pacific concept is not um, warmly received by all countries in the region. Um, some countries are on record as being um, hostile to this concept for their own um, perfectly uh, valid reasons, and other countries are rather indifferent to it. They would rather it just um, went away. So what is the, the Indo-Pacific concept? Well, I think, you know, I've done a lot of work on, uh, and, and there's a huge sort of industry uh, out there um, looking at understanding and making sense of this Indo-Pacific concept, both in a conceptual sense, but also in a policy application. But really, I think you can divide it up um, in, uh, in three ways. Well, firstly, as the Indo-Pacific just being a regional descriptor, this is a new way to describe the region. It's a new map. Um, it's a region that's always been there, but one that has become so important with the, the rise of economic dynamism in the region um, and uh, the rise of um, strategic competition. Secondly, um, if it's not a neutral descriptor, as um, some of its adv advocates would attempt to convince um, other non-participatory states, um, maybe it's more of a mental map. Maybe it's more of a way, like a sort of a worldview or a strategic perspective on, on the region, um, uh, like a, a geopolitical construct that can then be used to serve uh, political purposes. And of course, those purposes won't be shared by all actors in the region. Um, and each country, or at least those that adopt the, the concept, all have their own Indo-Pacific map. They all look slightly different. And I'll, I'll point these out in a, in a, in a second. Um, so um, the, the third aspect to this is that the Indo-Pacific has become associated with a strategy now. And this is where it becomes less neutral, less objective, and more, more freighted um, with, uh, with, with policy implications. So of course, um, Japan was actually the first one to coin this, uh, this uh, free and open Indo-Pacific vision in 2016. And the United States followed with its um, Indo-Pacific strategy report and its own free and own Indo-Pacific, from now on I'll say FOIP to, to, to save breath. 
Um, ASEAN has its um, outlook on the Indo-Pacific, and Australia also has a more sort of ambiguous Indo-Pacific strategy. So what have been um, peninsular responses to this? So if we have a look at, um, at, uh, at the ROK and see how uh, it's responded to this sort of unveiling of this Indo-Pacific concept and the, the free and open Indo-Pacific and, and all those things that are associated with it, the Quad and so forth, um, I think we can see um, you know, from, from my own reading um, and, uh, and, and that, that I uh, collaborated with, uh, with my uh, Korean uh, research uh, assistant in, in a recent article in Pacific Review, um, we looked at the discourse that was going on in, in uh, South Korea and uh, we basically found that um, Seoul is really tends to be um, more keen on retaining the more neutral Asia-Pacific descriptor rather than this kind of controversial Indo-Pacific um, uh, ploy that's been used by the, um, the, the, the US aligned powers. Um, I think Korea potentially sees the Indo-Pacific as maybe a, a divisive um, concept, um, drawing sort of uh, battle lines in an, in an arena between those that are involved in it and those aren't, and that it's unnecessarily pro provocative towards China. Um, and what, you know, what, what drives this perception is that um, Obviously, the proximity, strategic proximity, geographical proximity of um, of the peninsula to China, to these all of these flashpoints in in, in East Asia, um, but also um, that that Korea, like like most countries in the region, has what I call an economic security disconnect. So this is that its um, its economic incentives and imperatives are fully directed at um, China. Um, its prosperity is dependent upon China. Um, to, to a large degree, whereas it has these existing security commitments with the United States. And of course, that you know, is obviously a guarantee against North Korean aggression as well. Um, but, but South Korea you know, has sort of you know, somewhat reticently been compelled to engage with the concept because of its alliance relationship with the United States. The United States says, this is a big thing, it's really important to us. What are you going to do to you know, support this? What are you going to do to help us? Um, and the fact that other middle powers like Australia and Japan have also, you know, um, really put this at the forefront of their official government discourses. Um, so there are points of convergence um, between South Korea and the, uh, the Indo-Pacific concept. Um, the idea of sort of shared values, democracy, human rights, free trade, all this kind of thing. And also, um, you know, we've seen that South Korea has been very keen to harness its new southern policy. Um, or, or I think it's sort of slightly been modified recently, New Southern Policy Plus or something, with aspects of American Indo-Pacific strategy and the FOIP um, that share a focus on um, Southeast Asia as a pivotal region in this, this Indo-Pacific map. So really South Korea has kind of, kind of tried to reinterpret um, or, or, or sort of um, conciliate with the United States um, and is prepared to cooperate with countries like the United States, but also it particularly pointed out with middle powers such as Australia on issue specific um, aspects of, of the Indo-Pacific um, uh, construct. Um, I think that the United States has provide, uh, pressure, provided, uh, 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 applied a certain degree of pressure on, uh, on its ally in Seoul to support the FOIP and the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, but that China has been, uh, sorry, that uh, South Korea has been um, quite reluctant to, you know, to, to, to be placed into a, a more confrontation, confrontational stance, especially the American concept, um, uh, um, conception of the Indo-Pacific is, is quite confrontational, um, going back to Trump. Um, and so, so um, South Korea has, has not had um, any expressed interest in, in, in the Quad, as far as I know. Um, and then also, of course, you know, it brings in the question of the historical disputes that um, South Korea has with, uh, with Japan. Uh, Japan was the originator of the, the, the FOIP um, and so, um, um, you know, and a big champion of this, of this concept. And so for, uh, that's another reason that the ongoing historical issues, um, disputes with, um, with, with uh, Japan have made um, Seoul somewhat uh, lacklustre in its enthusiasm for the, um, the Indo-Pacific um, concept and, and the FOIP and Quad policies that underlie it. So let's move on thirdly now to the, the impact on the regional security dynamics in the Korean Peninsula security more specifically. I mean, basically, the Indo-Pacific is a, a kind of a very large pan-regional strategy. It's not 
specifically directed at the at Korean Peninsula security. Um, and so it may, you know, actually detract a little bit from that focus that is, you know, in East Asia and Northeast Asia, and particularly for, for, for Seoul, but as, you know, also for Beijing, um, it, the, the whole expansion of the strategic landscape um, may sort of um, uh, distract attention away from very specific um, peninsula issues, um, especially given the sort of the, the heavy kind of China connotations about uh, or China focused connotations of the Indo Pacific idea. Nevertheless, I think the peninsula will remain this so-called unstable pivot point of Northeast Asia, to quote um, Kent Calder and Min um, It remains uh, a major sub-regional focus for all of the Indo-Pacific actors, I mean, Japan, uh, um, the United States, South Korea, um, China, all, all of these, right? But they, they all have their own um, perspectives on what they want to see come out of um, peninsula, uh, a resolution of the peninsula um, nuclear security problem, whether they're more um, leaning towards sort of phased denuclearization, as we've we've pretty much um, heard from uh, from um, from uh, Dr. Lee Nan, or whether or not, for example, like Japan wants the complete um, uh, denuclearization of of, um, of the peninsula, the CVID formula. Um, also, I think um, um, yeah, I was reading an interesting piece by uh, Jagannath Panda, I think from IDSA in India, and uh, he described um, the Korean Peninsula as a critical alliance frontier of the Indo-Pacific, that, um, that um, Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States puts a real premium on allies as part of its network security architecture, and that this is also a little bit of a test for the, um, the ROK-US alliance. Um, the, um, and I'll come back to that in a second. But also, of course, um, under Trump, tr um, the United States has been more demanding um, of, you know, of material support and contributions to the US alliance in order to, to um, retain its security guarantees. Um, and yet they still, um, both uh, Washington and Seoul, have some differences on military strategy towards the DPRK. And of course, uh, as has been mentioned before, um, the PRC-DPRK alliance is also a, a factor in this equation. Um, so it's a very, very kind of complex multi-level game that's being played here on, on a number of levels. Um, and I think, you know, this is where, you know, um, it, uh, my, my own remarks refract uh, those of, uh, of, of Dr. Lee Nan. Um, certainly, the United States may place increasing pressure or, or attempt to on Beijing to fix the DPRK denuclearization problem. And this may become a renewed issue in their, um, in their ongoing rivalry. Um, and, and this, of course, might place um, the ROK uh, both with an enormous stake in East Asian security, uh, but also as a US ally, um, put it in, 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 in the middle and, 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 and sort of catch it in the middle. Um, the US, Japan, Australia also continue to um, uh, pressure the DPRK over you know, proliferation and, and offshore transfers and, and everything. Um, and they also express their, you know, their um, their desire for um, for China to do more to assist with this um, this sanction busting process. Um, and so, you know, how much um, the United States is able to, you know, put forward um, you know, a constructive um, North Korea policy that actually delivers results, unlike the kind of the fancy showboat summits of Trump, which literally achieved nothing, if anything were, were negative, at least in terms of U.S. outcomes. Um, but this is also a litmus test um, for U.S. credibility in the wider Indo-Pacific region as well. And then, of course, lastly, again, you know, um, this is always the challenge of going second. That Lee, Lee Nan has uh, has mentioned a lot of interesting things that I would have would have raised myself, but he's he's already put them on the table. But of course, there's the um, the, the the you know the nuclear proliferation issue. I mean, DPRK nukes affect the regional strategic balance and equation, and this, of course, may lead to what everybody fears, which is this kind of cascading um, uh, regional nuclearization, whether it be, you know, Japan, South Korea, um, or, or so forth. So let me just wrap up my remarks here um, and, uh, and summarize what I think the key takeaways are. 
So the first thing is that this Indo-Pacific concept is potentially divisive. Um, it very much um, starts to harden the uh, sort of the competitive battle lines, if you like, of the the, the free and open Indo-Pacific, the FOIP versus the BRI um, as, uh, as sort of demarcating spheres of influence and competing for, for uh, regional states' adherence. Um, and maybe poor ten, so you know, people have talked about this new Cold War, and you know, the, the, the Indo-Pacific has become this new cockpit for, for regional rivalry and strategic competition. Certainly, this is throughout Australian documents, as it is with many others. And middle powers like um, South Korea, you know, are potentially, you know, as this. I, I'm not sure. What, I, I've been told different things about uh, using the phrase the the proverbial shrimp among whales, whether or not that's sort of acceptable to use or not. But but ju just to you know invoke that um, you know with the the, the caveats uh, attached to it that you know that the ROK really doesn't want to get caught in the middle. In fact, you know none of these middle powers, especially ASEAN countries, want to be caught in the middle of this accelerating um, uh, rivalry and strategic competition. And whatever happens, you know, any shifts in the strategic balance um, will, will impact upon peninsular security. Secondly, um, it seems that South Korea, at least uh, until, uh, 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 until the last time that I sort of looked at this a few months ago, is, is something of a, a reticent and passive adherent to the Indo-Pacific concept. It's not something that they really feel strongly about or, or, or really, you know, really contribute to. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, the concept, the the big discourse that's been going on about the concept um, in in other regional capitals, um, or the U.S. and allied um, FOIP strategies, and then very very lastly, um, uh, I think that uh, DPR de denuclearization, peninsula reunification, is absolutely intrinsically linked um, to Indo-Pacific strategic dynamics. It's always been one of these regional flashpoints, along with some others like Taiwan Strait, um, uh, Dokdo, uh, and, and so forth, um, uh, Diao Yudao, as, uh, as you would say in China uh, as well. Um, and so it's, it remains one of these pivotal sub-regions of this expanded Asia-Pacific map. So as I said, you know, we, we broaden everything and we look at this greater map only to narrow back in and see that this remains a pivotal issue um, when we return to it. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilkins, for your presentation. Uh, your presentation very concise but very well thought out, uh, touched upon various, various issues we can discuss uh, later in the session. Uh, actually, his paper, his presentation, uh, touched upon the various aspects of the Indo-Pacific, ranging from the concepts to the South Korea's responses to the Indo-Pacific, as well as its uh, impact on the regional security dynamics and uh, landscapes. So I uh, the issues uh, taken up in his presentation is really, really co comprehensive. And uh, he basically touched upon the, all the important issues and questions related to the Indo-Pacific. I very much look forward to the uh, lively and uh, uh, heated uh, discussions from the discussant. Now I would like to briefly introduce discussants in this panel. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, the presenters can see. Oh, now you, you can see the pre uh, discussants on uh, in this panel. On my left, I have uh, Professor John Dallory of Yonsei University, uh, and also on my uh, to the left. Uh, I also have a Professor Im Eun Jung from Gongju National University. And on my right, uh, I have uh, Dr. Kim Bo Mi from Institute of National Strategy uh, Studies. And also uh, Dr. Kim Sung Chol of Seoul National University will join us online, online uh, later in this session. So why don't we uh, start with uh, John Dallory's discussion? Mm -hmm. Should we take my mask off? It's up to you. It's up to you. Okay. okay, I guess I. Okay, I will take off the mask. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you to Kais, to, to, uh, to Ji Huan, and, and colleagues here. And uh, Li Nan, it's great to see you from afar. Uh, really enjoyed uh, these, uh, these papers or abstracts and presentations. Um, and I'll just try to kick off our discussion here with some reflections, mostly. 
uh, to the topic that Linan uh, addresses, but also uh, maybe a quick comment to Professor Wilkins uh, as well, who presented very interesting broader reflections on the Indo-Pacific, um, because I guess one of the things I would like to hear us talk about it more from the presenters is we're, we're using the word strategy a lot, but I think when it comes to North Korea, we're often not having a strategic conversation. We're not talking in the, in the simple sense of how does the part fit with the whole. Instead, we really, and those of us in this room, uh, we're so used to this North Korea conversation where we talk around the same things and we actually don't zoom out and look at it as a part of the whole, which is what strategic thinking is supposed to be about. So I think this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, but, but let me start that by, you know, for fun, challenging you, uh, Professor Lee, a little bit. Um, although there are elements of this, I think, in your uh, presentation, but um, my own view for some time of, I guess, my own understanding of PRC, DPRK relations um, and you can correct me here, uh, and this could represent some kind of wishful uh, American thinking, um, but I've always been drawn to the tension in that relationship, to the stress points, and I, I feel your presentation, you certainly acknowledge those, but I'd like to hear more about how resilient you really think that uh, relationship is, because on, on some of those same points where you stressed where there's common ground and common interest. Let me just, again, challenge you a little bit where I see uh, the, the tension points in that relationship. Um, on, on security, and we'll see how the two countries celebrate the, the anniversary of the Treaty Alliance coming up in July, but um, it is quite remarkable that North Korea is China's only uh, treaty ally, of course. Um, but you know, as Americans know all too well, and that's part of the Indo-Pacific prob problem, uh, alliances are used also to control when they're asymmetrical, like China and North Korea relationship. They're used to control and constrain. Uh, for that, I would I would just go to Victor Cha's book on power play, where he explains how actually these alliances are both to protect non-communist states, but also hold them back. Uh, and I I see a, a strong element, especially now, um, of that in terms of the China North Korea alliance. And North Korea quite actively resisting that, quite aware of that dynamic and really uh, unhappy with it. So whereas you present North Korea is able to kind of lean on China for security, I'm, I'm much more skeptical of that. In terms of the shared ideology, the fact that they're both Communist Party uh, countries, of course, Vietnam is the easy case of a Communist Party country that China invaded uh, uh, in the last time it sent troops out of its border. So, um, you know, sharing ideology and, and a system uh, is no guarantee of getting along. Um, in terms of geography, the long border, as the case of India can be used to show, uh, can be as much, you know, a source of dispute and conflict as it is one of shared strategic interest in keeping that border stable. So I think, again, the geography and the way in which North Korea is cut off and has cut, it, it keeps itself cut off uh, from, from uh, uh, you know, because of hostile relations with Japan, hostile relations with South Korea, hostile relations with the United States, the geographical effect is North Korea is boxed in and pressed up against China in a way that I think uh, actually makes it uncomfortable. And then the last one would be on the economic side. As we all know, China has come to completely dominate North Korea's external economic relations. Uh, I think we have to see after COVID, it will all depend on the diplomacy as well. But if I'm Kim, Kim Jong-un, I, I don't, you know, imagining where over decades, right, yeah, as he imagines he has decades ahead of him, thinking about the future of my national economy, post-COVID, I want to somehow become less dependent, uh, certainly not more or even maintain the level of dependency on China. So to me, these are all real pressure points in that relationship. And, um, and, and again, I'd love to hear more from you, Professor Lee, on if you think that's exaggerated, if you think it's uh, um, compensated in other ways. Um, Chair, I'm cognizant of time, so you can just start to cut me off. Okay. Um, but I did want to... Um, shift a little bit over to the Professor Wilkins and the Indo-Pacific, and uh, but also let me segue with it, one more question to you, uh, Linan, which is again about 
strategy. I'm not sure you explain to us what is China's strategy when it comes to, say, North Korea in the sense of the bigger picture of what is trying to, China trying to achieve in the region and now as a global power, how does North Korea fit into that? You know, the, the most obvious pressing example is Sino-US relations, which are, of course, in a period of, of increasing uh, acrimony, and that's likely to continue. That's at the center of strategic uh, debate and national security discussion in the United States. North Korea is quite peripheral but China is right at the center. Now, I assume in, in Beijing, China uh, managing the United States is at the center uh, of the strategic debate. Well, how is North Korea related to that? And these goals you've articulated of essentially wanting to have an amicable relationship, get along with North Korea, you termed it a strategic partnership, um, gradually getting toward denuclearization uh, in a non-coercive way. How does that fit with uh, U.S.-China relations, uh, broader regional and, uh, and global strategy. And then uh, lastly, um, a, a question, and again, kind of a challenge, uh, Professor Wilkins, to you. Um, you focused, I, uh, as I heard you, focused more on South Korea and South Korea's uh, quite ambivalent relationship with the, even the concept of Indo-Pacific, which I, I, actually I think if we look at your wonderful map, you can also explain it just with the map. I mean, if you look at those circles, if you think about, you know, what did we say before Indo-Pacific? We, we called this Northeast Asia, and Korea's smack dab in the middle of Northeast Asia. You can't talk about Northeast Asia without the Korean Peninsula in the center. Uh, otherwise, we had East Asia. Korea is still central to any discussion of East Asia. But when you talk about Indo-Pacific, uh, Korea becomes marginalized. So I think even in a sort of geostrategic way, there, in addition to the six or seven points, I think there's, there's a lot of points why this, uh, this concept doesn't really catch on very well in a, in a Korean context. But lastly, again, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more of your thoughts about, uh, and in the, the circles that you're in of, of developing the uh, strategic ideas around the Indo-Pacific, which, which you know, I think this is the ultimate example of Australian soft power, now the Americans are all calling it the Indo-Pacific as well. Um, you know, I'm not sure I see a lot of thinking about the same challenge to Professor Lee. I, I don't see very interesting discussions about North Korea in the Indo-Pacific conversation. You know, it seems to focus on a lot of things, but not really generating new or clear concepts about uh, uh, North Korea. So am I missing that, or do you think that's a, a blind spot? Um, in, in the strategy. I'd be very curious to hear a little bit more about that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank yeah. you very much, Chair. Thank you, Professor Dallory. And now we have Professor Lee Moon Jung for her discussion. Okay, sure, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for including me to this wonderful panel. I really um, enjoy uh, the discussion. Um, let me just uh, share my own observation first, and, and I'm going to give some quick questions to the two wonderful presenters. Number one is um, I, I truly appreciate this kind of mixture and a good balance between a bigger picture and a smaller picture or more specific picture. Uh, but number one point I'd like to highlight about the bigger picture is how to deal with the, the so-called to China. Um, I don't want to say the rise of China anymore because China is already there. And uh, how to deal with China is, of course, is an overarching theme for everyone. Um, it's, I, I'm not saying you know, we are demonizing China. Rather, it's more about ontology, you know, simply because of the size, the scale, um, and the substance of its change, or the speed. So it's um, simply overwhelming, and not only just to its neighbor, including, of course, South Korea and the Japan, or even North Korea. So it's overwhelming. That's number one phenomena we see. And number two um, phenomena today uh, we see is, again, the, um, this kind of new type of more, um, I, it's not an ideological competition. It's subtly different from the Cold War 
um, ideological um, competition, but still we do see, um, again, the rivalry surrounding the, uh, the legitimacy issue. Again, the Kurt Campbell or many other those Biden people keeps, keep talking about this, again, the legitimacy. So it's more about, I think, um, I interpret this in this way, again, it's more about the regime type which means, which indicates that as long as it's about the regime type, which regime type can be um, more competitive in this era, especially with the uh, pandemic-like situations, um, you know, it, it, it is related to the identity issues too um, of many democratic countries. So that is why it's really difficult, even though we want to be pragmatic, even though we want to in a good position between somewhere, uh, we here refer to the South Korea, but still is very difficult because we face these kind of you know big iceberg-like um, situations. So my understanding is again the so-called FOIP, free and open. I I really enjoyed. Um, um, uh, Professor Wilkins, that presentation, so-called the free and open in the Pacific. Um, I do see this as a part of this kind of bigger competition picture. And the thing is, um, the United States alone, alone uh, cannot achieve whatever. One point I, I, I can add is again, not that many people are talking about the end state of this rivalry. I, I, I try to understand what basically or fundamentally the today's US is trying to achieve after all this competition. But still, even Washingtonians, they are policymakers, even they are vague with talking about that. But still, um, still whatever the, the, the end state of the uh, competition is, is for, uh, still the America alone cannot, um, cannot achieve the goal. That's the reality. Um, of course, number one reason is simply the in the Pacific region is too too wide or too broad, too large. And number two is America is not the, the America we, we knew, we used to know, right? <laughs> so as there are so many all this, you know, domestic um, challenges, uh, the other panelist this morning, um, he, he mentioned that, you know, it's politically America is now broken. <laughs> so, well, it's, it's up to your own um, interpretation, but anyhow, the today's US is not the US we used to know. So having said that, okay, having said that uh, our um, panel is supposed to talk about the future of um, Korean peace process and uh, uh, regional, uh, regional, I'm sorry, regional uh, security situation. So having had this big picture, you know, Korean peace process, where can we put that um, in, the, in the big, big picture? So that's, you know, our concern. Um, to be very honest, um, I um, do think, um, you know, ending the hostility first uh, that's the kind of entrance, uh, in theory, uh, for the uh, uh, Korean peace process. I do think it does make sense, but the thing is, it's not that likely. It's, it's not that likely to happen. Um, you know, ending the hostility first, and then let's move on to the more like a pragmatic, step by step, incremental approach, whatever you describe. Okay, it the sounds in theory, it sounds uh, sensical. Um, because you know the absence or shortage or lack of the uh, uh, trust, mutual trust, is really the fundamental problem of everyone here uh, in this region. So, just declare or whatever, um, just ending the hostility um, for for some good reasons uh, can be um, regarded um, as a one good step um, toward the further steps. But the thing is, again, it's not that uh, likely to happen. So denuclearization, um, you know, it's, it's a long, long, long process. It's a CVID. I, I just really would like to ask, you know, each those you know, policy maker of Washington, what exactly are you trying to do, again, the C means complete, we all know the, what the acronym um, stands for, but technologically it does need a serious, serious and a complicating steps. So without those you know, technological support, um, it, it might not be really that likely uh, to achieve those you know, goals. So having these, uh, this, I'm gonna end in my, um, my um, comments, but having said that, okay, you know, we have a big picture, um, rivally competitive situ 
situation, and at the same time, we are trying to pursue still um, Korean peace process. Of course, I, I, I said I, I already shared my um, little pessimistic view about the uh, Korean peace process. But again, in theory, I I, uh, I agree with the uh, uh, kind of incrementalism. So having said that, what really can be the common ground uh, for everyone um, in this region to engage again the North Korea uh, for the further uh, peace building in this region? Of course, we don't want to violate um, resolution, or we don't want to just, um, how would you say, to give the uh, hard currency uh, through the inter-Korean cooperation or whatever, or we don't want to be uh, just solely punitive, or we don't want to suffocate them all the time. Um, but um, if so, I mean, what can, what, which, what kind of agenda, what topic can really be um, more like, how would you say, complementary uh, for the uh, future step? So my question um, is uh, to the Dr. Lee, what kind of agenda can China suggest? I mean, the, for everyone here. Of, of course, I'm not saying that you know we need to just lift up the uh, whatever those denuclearization related issue. That that's one thing, and one big thing, or even fundamental thing. But additionally, what else? I mean, can we can we do together uh, to deal with this um, country again, the North Korea? And the Dr. Wilkins, and how about the Austria's interest here? Australia, I'm sorry, <laughs> Austria. I'm very sorry. Australia's interest, or what, what agenda uh, can Australia be interested in? Um, nuclear definitely um, can be one good agenda. I think Australia, like country, middle power country, a good um, global citizen like country, can uh, contribute, but what else? What else um, can um, Australia contribute? So, those are my um, that's all of my uh, my part, and uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you for including me. Yeah, thank you, Professor Lim. Now, uh, let me turn over to uh, Dr. Kim. Hi, uh, I'm Bomi Kim from Insti Institute uh, for National Security Strategy. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, I hope this meeting will be very productive to share our experience and knowledge all together. Um, jumping into the discussion um, regarding the first presentation about uh, China and North Korea alliance, uh, I have some comments and questions uh, on that issue. Well, North Korea and China, now they are ahead of uh, renewal of their alliance treaty this year. So they are supposed to renew the uh, alliance treaty in every 60 years, and this is the year. So this is a very important year for both countries. Um, and uh, they, uh, well, North Korea also entered into a alliance with the Soviet Union in 1961 July, but uh, as a uh, socialist bloc collapsed, uh, their alliance treaty was terminated. But uh, North Korea and China still maintains the alliance treaty, and that, and then, you know, like probably there were ups and downs uh, in the last 60 years, but they are still good friends now. Uh, however, um, uh, for the renewal of the treaty. Um, maybe I want to ask uh, Dr. Lee about the, any possible revision or um, delete of the clause of the treaty. Uh, treaty. So, well, treaty is scheduled to be renewed this year. So, uh, for example, like according to the treaty, China is forced to enter into uh, in, uh, forced to protect and help North Korea in any kind of um, provoked aggression. So maybe China feel uncomfortable with that if North Korea is like breaking out the war on the Korean Peninsula, then automatically China has to be involved in that conflict to protect and help assist North Korea. So that might be the uncomfortable situation for China because uh, China has to fight, uh, might be, uh, might fight against, uh, you know, United States and uh, Japan and um, South Korea. They are all like uh, big trading partners of 
China. So maybe uh, as the strategic environment has been changed, China may want to like revise the alliance treaty. So I do not believe that none of uh, none of them want to terminate the treaty itself, but uh, they might want some minor revision in the alliance commitment. So I want to uh, hear your opinion about that issue. And uh, regarding uh, that, uh, my first question, uh, I also wanted to know uh, what do you think? What do you think is the possibility of President Xi Jinping's uh, visit to Pyongyang this year? So well. I know that you mentioned that they have met like five times in less five, less three years, so they might be seeking out of each other to see <laughs> to see each other. So, but however, uh, if North Korea is having a six years anniversary ceremony thing in Pyongyang this year, then they might invite uh, President Xi to Pyongyang, right? Then um, it'll be a perfect excuse for opportunity for President Xi Jinping to visit Pyongyang uh, for the first time in his life, I think. Well, so, well, if it comes to, the, if they have a meeting in Pyongyang, then it will be kind of, uh, it will be very symbolic and will have a lot of political influences in the region, I think. Well, uh, for from uh, North Korean side, uh, Kim Jong Un might use that uh, opportunity, uh, might use that meeting to enhance Pyongyang's bargaining position uh, with uh, Seoul and Washington. So uh, I'm curious, uh, what do you think about uh, that possibility? And uh, on the second issue um, about the IP concept, IP concept. Well, I don't think, uh, I think, well, the South Korean government should be able to answer two questions. Uh, first one is, is there enough region to participate in IP or quote? Or second, and second, is it good for South Korea? I think the answer for both, both questions might be not sure or maybe not. Well, uh, I'm uncertain. I'm, Pretty much uncertain that like whether China will persuade North Korea and lead the way to denuclearization as South Korean government wants. However, <clears throat> South Korean government is very well aware that uh, South Korea should uh, pretty much like the South Korean government should be cooperative with. Uh, China and then uh, should be should maintain good relations or uh, should maintain a close relationship with Chinese government. So, and uh, denuclearization of North Korea is the as long as denuclearization of North Korea is remaining as the most urgent security concern of South Korea, uh, then like for that reason, it is necessary for South Korea to cooperate with China. So, and uh, we cannot be decisive at this moment. So, well, um, I don't think we need to, the South Korean government in, doesn't need to confirm uh, its position <coughs> under the current situation. So that's, my comment about the second presentation. I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kim. Now uh, we have last but not the least the uh, discussant, uh, uh, Professor Kim Sung Chol of Seoul National University. Uh, now he uh, he's with us online. So, Professor Kim, uh, can you give us a discussion for maximum ten minutes? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee and uh, uh, Professor Lee and Professor uh, uh, Wilkinson. Uh, very interesting uh, presentations, and uh, I learned a lot. Uh, because of time, uh, I would like to uh, raise a question to Professor Lee Nan Wan and uh, to uh, Professor Wilkinson. Uh, one question. Okay. Uh, I would like to raise a question about the nature of a, a peace building on the Korean Peninsula. The Chinese government has argued that uh, there should be a dual track approach, that is a denuclearization and the building of a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula at the same time. This approach is generally accepted by South Korea and other countries. But we need to pin down 
what the nature of the peace, uh, peace regime building should be. Many people believe uh, the two, two steps are crucial. One is the declaration of end of the Korean War. The other is replacement of the armistice agreement with a peace treaty. However, a quick a key question here is how to eliminate the sources of conflict. Will the two steps be able to ensure or assure peace on the Korean Peninsula? I believe that these steps are uh, the only beginning of the peace process. The North Korean uh, uh, leader Kim Jong-un also hinted it once by saying that peace cannot come with a peace treaty in a paper. Apparently, he calculates uh, military balance and the concerns about uh, uh, escalation of arms race surrounding the Korean Peninsula. In essence, I believe that legally binding negative secret assurance must follow those formal steps. This legally binding negative security assurance must cover concern the security of the entire Korean Peninsula. This is particularly true amid the intensifying U.S.-China rivalry. We have to take into account three aspects. First, the negative security assurance must be given to South Korea as well as North Korea. And uh, uh, second, P5, the five permanent member states of the United, Secret, uh, United Nations Secret Council should be involved in the negative security assurance not simply surrounding the great powers, but uh, extra regional uh, nuclear states should participate. Thirdly, I concern that uh, the nuclear capability and missile capability of United States, China, and Russia, they must uh, reduce uh, uh, their arms significantly. In other words, uh, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula involves uh, not only denuclearization of North Korea, but also a uh, nuclear-free uh, Korean Peninsula, or particularly South Korea. So uh, nuclear advancement and missile development uh, surrounding areas should be seriously uh, eliminated. And uh, as to Professor Wilkinson's presentation, uh, I mostly agree uh, with your points. and. Uh, uh, what I wanted to add my point is that all the security cooperation, whether it is uh, uh, alliance or uh, uh, secret partnership or whatever, uh, history tells that the burden sharing uh, and uh, uh, commitment, two issues are very important. So burden sharing and commitment goes hand, hand in hand. Uh, the country uh, that cannot contribute in burden sharing and in commitment, just like uh, South Korea during the Cold War period. Uh, the country is located uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the security cooperation at the bottom. The top country, like the U.S., uh, can be state, uh, situated at the top. Japan, in the middle, it is because it is not willing to commit itself defend so the uh, uh, region, but it can contribute the aid to other countries, including South Korea and the Southeast Asian countries. So uh, these uh, burden sharing and commitment issues involve uh, disputes, how to divide the burden, and uh, why uh, each state should shoulder such a burden. Uh, with uh, regard to uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, any U.S. unidirectional pro uh, proposal regarding the, uh, these two issues in detail is likely to raise disputes among the four states. The United States seems eager to induce concerted efforts of the three other partners to counterbalance China, but the four states differ in their interest. Japan is primarily concerned about uh, securing sea lanes in South China Sea and the territorial disputes in East China Sea. But Tokyo continues to try to expand bilateral uh, relations with Beijing. Indo-Pacific strategy from the U.S. perspective has apparently 
raised the geographical importance of Australia. But Canberra considers the Indo-Pacific and the Quad two different things. India is in dispute with China on the border, and it has been critical of China's Belt and Road Initiative, particularly of China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is passed through Kashmir, which is under dispute between India and Pakistan. But India is a founding member of the ASEAN Infrastructure Investment Bank and is one of the eight recipients of the bank. India accommodates China's initiative in the multilateral context. As soon as burden sharing and commitment issues would uh, come to the uh, uh, topic of dispute, the idea of the uh, strategy and the quad is likely to be diluted soon. In addition, uh, in order for uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy and the quad to become a solid foundation of the secret cooperation, the top power, the United States, must induce active participation of the small states uh, neighboring with China. As the state, uh, strategy is based on geopolitical consideration, it covers not only the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, but also it includes the sub-regions such as Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Northeast Asia. But the small states neighboring with China are not really interested in balancing China or bandwagoning the Indo-Pacific strategy. The most probable candidates for helping the strategy are Vietnam, Singapore, and Thailand. But all of them take on a hatching strategy toward China. They try to take advantage of economic cooperation and seek benefits stemmed from the Belt and Road Initiative, although they are keen to the China risk that is over-reliance on China. Without frontline states in uh, Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean and the Central Asia, what is the use of, of the Indo-Pacific strategy and the fund? What are the alternatives to the Indo-Pacific strategy and the fund? How should China's neighbors contribute to, to reconfigure uh, uh, the present Indo-Pacific strategy for the security and peace in the region and in coping with rising China's economic advance in the region and its course of diplomacy? To narrow my discussion uh, uh, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, an ideal scenario for South Korea might be as follows. South Korea joins the Quad Plus, that is taking a new unprecedented commitment to the security cooperation that U.S. leads. And South Korea would be able to have a leverage to adjust its objective within the Indo-Pacific strategy frame, that is maintaining the importance of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the mix of engagement and balancing vis-a-vis -vis China, rather than checking and balancing China. In my humble opinion, however, this scenario seems not a uh, possible or realistic idea. Instead of taking part in the Indo-Pacific strategy, which is very unclear and uh, poorly defined, it is a feasible strategy for South Korea to keep out. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Professor Kim. Now, uh, discussions actually raised a lot of questions and issues, but I think all the questions and issues are practically important as well as intellectually stimulating. So now time for presenters to respond. So uh, why don't we start with uh, Dr. Lin An? So would you respond to the questions and issues raised in the discussion? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the all questions. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think uh, a lot of the participants give me very insightful uh, question on my presentation. Actually, I will uh, try to make my effort to answer the question one by one. And uh, thanks for joining this question. And uh, you raised the three kind of question. And uh, actually, I have to say, uh, China and DPRK 
right now is just I, I define we're just repairing the relationship since 2018. And you know, in 2017, in Lodong Shimon, the North Koreans still criticize China. So right now, we, we're trying to repair our relationship and still we have to define each other why, what kind of the, the, the other part, the, the, the other side is uh, how, how we see that strategically. And also, I have to say, China and the DPRK have uh, our own concept of security. And uh, so, uh, we always say we are independent, we, we have the uh, policy independent. And, uh, and also, we think we have to take care of others' concerns. So now, I think we are trying to uh, figure out what kind of the other part is fit in our strategy or in their strategy. And uh, so, so how to can we have uh, develop and secure the country? Also, we can fit uh, we we can fit the other interest. So this is the China DPRK right now we are concerning about. That's why recently you can see the recent uh, official statement released by China and DPRK. We always define uh, emphasis on the traditional means. Uh, the traditional is our foundation, and we have to look up forward to future and how to defend strategic partnership. So this is uh, this is we have to. This is why right now means very very clear. We have a different uh, concept of security, and uh, and second, economically, I think uh, uh, I we expected that the after the coronavirus, China the DPRK trade will probably will be rise rapidly and uh, uh, will be really big rise. And uh, but the China's dominance on North Korean economy doesn't mean China has the political influence on North Korea. And uh, I just I said North Korean the leadership is still very wary of the China's influence. So economy is one side, and China want to help North Korea to develop their economy, not focus on military. But also we still have very have a very limited the the the, the political influence on North Korea. Who always say we have a different views on uh, uh, different views from you, so you don't know my uh, situation. So this is this is a uh, 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 economy, and also how how North Korea can fit China's strategy. Uh, I think um, so. Right now, it depends on how China defines on U.S. role, and uh, right, right now, until now, we still think. U.S. is a competitor, also co cooperator. That means we have to. Uh, China can uh, competition with the United States. Also, we still think for cooperation. This is the uh, right current China's uh, uh, judgment on America. So it's so that's why uh, so China still leave us a uh, cooperative space to uh, United States on the North Korean nuclear issue. That's why we still want to cooperate with the United States to push North Korean to denuclear themselves. Also, make the Korean Peninsula uh, become a nuclear-free peninsula. This is a China really want to leave this cooperation space for United States. But also, if United States still keep the hostile, uh, according to North Korean's defense, hostile uh, policy toward North Korea and never move. Then China, what China can do is still China want to help North Korean economy. This is uh, no doubt, and uh, and uh, and also we want to in long term we want to North Korea to focus on economy and uh, if the military uh, uh, aside. So this is what China's I think, and also we think uh, right now still China never think. No, uh, United States is whole competitor or an enemy. So that's why I think North Korean our China, uh, Chinese global strategy very limit, very limited. So not 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 so much. This is uh, John's question, and uh, so Professor Lim. And uh, uh, besides the the, the nuclear uh, issue, and I think China uh, want want to. Uh, cooperate with other countries on the humanitarian issue in North Korea, and uh, that is really important. 
and also environmental. That is also important for China because because China tried to cooperate with North Korea on environmental issue, but actually China realized this is not only between China and North Korea, and China really like to cooperate with South Korea, ROK, and Japan, even Mongolia on this environmental issue, you know, the, the dust recent, recent making China very, very about too much. And, uh, and also China like to uh, try to uh, influence North Korea's concept of the economy, especially a market economy. And uh, so that's why China like to train the North Korean students and officials to, to uh, learn uh, the market uh, concept, market economy concept. And also China, uh, North Korean like to go outside. A lot of young men in North Korea like to go outside to study the, the new knowledge and the new technology and the new concept concept of the uh, economic market, as I know, when I was in North Korea, and I can see the young people really eager to go outside to learn. So that is uh, there are so many I think cooperative points uh, in in the besides the nuclear, and we can talk about and the cooperation, and uh, and for the treaty, I. Even I think China and uh, North Korea right now still never use alliance calling each other. And uh, the official sta statements say, say the strategic uh, partner. And uh, so, so uh, China have seen the lesson uh, in 2017. You know, the Trump, uh, Trump administration really looks like really like have a war in Korean Peninsula, making China really worry about the, 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 the chaos and the war uh, occur in, in, in Korean Peninsula. That's why China China like to review this treaty, but this is a, I don't think China will revise the treaty because the China will still want to keep the stability, don't not to make other people, the foreign country to suspect if we revise the city the treaty. So so we still want to keep the stability. And uh, but we still never try very cautious to say we are aligned with a strategic partner. That's mean though we don't have the burden of the alliance, we still have uh, flexible uh, uh, cooperation and flexible uh, thinking on each other. And uh, so depends on the situation, we can adjust our policy. And uh, also North Korea think the same way. And uh, so Right now, we no have the, 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 the trust like the uh, one between the lines. And uh, so that's why we have to, China and the DPRK still have to accumulate trust to each other. So that's why the lines still very, using the lines still very be sensitive in China. And uh, so Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping visit, I don't think she probably will visit uh, in North Korea recently. Because according to the communism culture, so she when she will really uh, have the formal with, with, visit in 2019, that is that is enough for our two countries, and uh, uh, they don't need to have another uh, presidential visit uh, to show the uh, the how strong uh, the two <laughs> countries. So I don't think she probably will visit in North Korea recently. And but the uh, high official uh, probably will exchange view and have a, a, a frequent visit uh, uh, in a forcible future. And uh, so actually, I think uh, after the Xi's visit, I think both countries have realized how important of the relationship is, and we know how to uh, figure out because you know since 2000, uh, since Yan time, you know uh, to the 20th to uh, 20th century. At that time, uh, North Korea and China have a long history and we know each other very well and how to cooperate, how to coordinate. This is, uh, this is uh, really become the routine. routine. So don't, don't, need, don't need to make another the, the leader to come to Pyongyang again or uh, Kim Jong-un visit China again. So that is, uh, so I think our relation is still there. And uh, uh, the Professor Kim's uh, question, I think the peace treaty is very, very important from China's perspective. 
and uh, and China still wants the two Korea can make the peace treaty and by themselves and then China can join them and uh, make the uh, treaty implemented and uh, so so from China's perspective the two Korea makes the treaty the peace treaty and uh, North Korea should denuclear themselves and uh, so uh, so both Korea should say no nuclear weapon in Korean Peninsula. And uh, but the, the thing is, we still very worry about the U.S. policy because, you know, we look at the Trump administration in the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear agreement. When the Trump go into the, went to the White House, he can drop this, he can just through this agreement immediately. So how to implement the peace treaty? Uh, is for China is really important. So uh, China want to find a way or uh, seek for the cooperation uh, with other country to implement uh, this peace treaty. That is more imp important because two Korea's relationship improve improve is uh, definitely China's interest. And uh, but how to implement the treaty is uh, more important than making the treaty. And uh, two Korea, you know, in history, two Korea make a lot of treaties and uh, make a lot of the agreement. But it uh, looks like uh, the other one side said no, they, they broke the they broke the uh, treaty or broke the agreement. The treaty become the, this like paper. And uh, so, for Chinese perspective, uh, implementation uh, implementation is more important than making the treaty. So, if if China can play the this role. And uh, I think China will be very glad to be to be to play this role uh, for the Korean Peninsula. This is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wilkins. Would you also respond to the questions? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you very much to all of those very um, insightful comments um, and points made by the uh, by the uh, the discussant panelists. Um, so there was a, a great deal of um, um, a, a great deal of discussion there um, that we could we could get into. So I'll just be a bit selective in, in the points that I respond to. Although um, actually um, the majority of points were were aimed at my my co-presenter, but um, there's definitely some some key um, issues brought up there that I like to to weigh in on. Um, firstly, um, Professor Delaunay's um, kind of question mark being attached to, you know, strategy and are these things um, really strategic? Well, if I think of, um, uh, you know, strategic approaches to the Indo-Pacific, in, in my case, uh, or in um, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of the Korean Peninsula, um, whether there's a clear strategy um, for denuclearization or dealing with North Korea or something. Um, when Japan launched its free and open Indo-Pacific um, idea. Um, it was originally branded a foreign policy strategy, but um, apparently that um, was slightly um, created some slight apprehensions amongst um, various ASEAN interlocutors. And so Japan tried to repackage its FOIP strategy as a vision instead to take the uh, sort of, uh, should we say, the hard edge of um, its uh, policy initiative. Nonetheless, I think if you do look at Japan's FOIP and especially the American Indo-Pacific strategy and it's, um, I think, the recently declassified document, it's something like the framework for the Indo-Pacific or Indo-Pacific framework or something. Um, these, I think, lay out very, very clearly what the strategic um, goals and objectives are of um, Japan and the United States, respectively. And uh, Australia doesn't have... Um, a uh, kind of a cognate document, but if you look at its um, its defence um, white paper and uh, most importantly its defence uh, its um, uh, foreign policy white paper of 2017 and its um, strategic defence update of 2020, it does lay out some very cl clear ideas of how it views the Indo-Pacific region, what challenges it identifies, and the kind of responses that it will take. The the, uh, the, the package of, of policies um, that it'll implement individually and collectively with its, um, its allies and partners. Um, I also, um, so, so I think that, you know, um, that especially now 
especially now we're out of the Trump era, where we and, and where the president had a, a superb way of muddying the waters um, of what American strategy towards the region would be. Um, I think we're. I think we can be a lot more confident about that. On in relation to the the North Korean issue in particular. Um, in terms of strategic approaches, well, yeah, that definitely remains to be seen. Uh, um, um, Professor Delory said, uh, you know, it sort of seems like deja vu when we're um, we're discussing the uh, Crimean Peninsula issues, um, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, I mean. I think it was about 10 years ago I was involved with the Korean Institute for National Unification and uh, we, you know, we, we examined the whole peninsula um, denuclearization and, and reunification um, situation and uh, it's very, very difficult to come up with, uh, with, with innovative um, approaches or, or, or policies to this and the situation has obviously deteriorated as uh, Pyongyang's capabilities have, uh, have been augmented. So uh, it's all, it still remains, you know, the land of belt Bad policy options, as I think some, someone famously said. Um, with regards to this whole idea of alliances and everything, this is, you know, this is something that I work on quite. Uh, I wrote my, my doctoral dissertation on, on, on alliances or, or coalition warfare, and I do a lot of work in this, this space still. Um, so, you know, we, we've been talking a little bit about the uh, the, 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 ROC, the 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 um, the the PRC DPRK. Um, alliance, but uh, it also kind of um, works the other way because uh, you know I think as uh, again as Professor Delory alluded to, um, North Korea um, can be used as uh, you know if we assume that uh, that, that uh, Beijing has some influence or some control um, either in terms of restraint or in terms of sort of loosening that restraint and using um, North Korea as a sort of a proxy. Um, that can put um, pressure, acts as a pressure point upon the US-South um, Korea alliance, of course. I mean, that's, that, that, that's a, a well-known um, angle that's been observed. Um, now, um, in, um, in terms of um, the focus on um, Northeast Asia or East Asia um, in the, the much broader Indo-Pacific uh, concept, I think... Um, you know, it, as I said, it's sort of, you know, we depart from there only to return to it. Um, so it still remains one of the important flashpoints, along with the others that, are, that are, I, I checked off before. But it is true, I think, that, that by widening the mental map um, in this uh, Indo-Pacific strategic construct, that much greater emphasis is put on India and the Indian Ocean, and of course, the confluence of the Indian and Pacific Oceans through all of those um, strategic waterways, the sea lines of communication that run through um, Indonesia and, and, and Malaysian waters and so forth between those two oceans, those massive shipping rope, uh, routes and, um, and uh, strategic choke points. And of course, that's where the South China Sea comes in as well. Um, and Southeast Asia in general, and then um, also added to that is the South Pacific region, which uh, you know China has sought to um, increase its political and economic influence, which is also an increasingly seen as a a, 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 um, uh, you know, a, a focal point for the Indo-Pacific strategy, especially for Australia, but also um, for Japan and the United States as well, perhaps less India. So I think there are, there's a stronger accent on on the Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia, and, and, and slash South China Sea, and um, South Pacific. Um, and it does detract a little bit away, as I said, from, um, from those um, East Asian or Northeast Asian security issues. That certainly is a really, really good point that, that needs to be recognised. Um, then sort of moving through onto um, uh, uh, what uh, Professor, um, Professor Lim raised, um, you know, what can Australia really contribute to the uh, peninsula security situation? Um, in practice, um, probably not a great deal, but in terms of intent, in terms of diplomacy, that kind of middle power diplomacy, Australia has always been very strong on non-proliferation, um, um, uh, was it a, a nuclear suppliers group, um, the joint, uh, I forget the name of the, of the institution now, but there's a joint um, sort of um, uh, 
denuclearization or disarmament kind of uh, um, organization between um, Japan and Australia. And that actually forms the nucleus of their joint strategic partnership or one of the focal points of their, their joint strategic partnership, Japan and Australia, is the Korean Peninsula issue, both the, the denuclearization, which of course is probably more important to Japan than it is for Australia, but it's about reciprocity. Um, and of course, the, the abductees issue, issue as well, um, uh, that Australia lends diplomatic support to Tokyo on the, the abductees issue. Um, also, um, you know, um, sort of to, um, to to move on, just and just to select out um, a couple of points by made by um, Professor um, Kim Kim Sung Chul. Um, this whole idea of the Quad as a proto alliance or something, uh, absolutely right to identify that there are divergences um, in how these countries look at the region, the order of priority that they place upon. Um, different security issues. I mean, really, can we expect Japan and Australia to come rushing to India's assistance in a border war with Pakistan? Um, probably not at the top of our list of, um, uh, of uh, priorities. Um, so, so there is definitely divergences. But you know, that's not to ignore um, the things that, that unite these countries. Um, particularly, and this is becoming really, really important to the discourse now, this notion of a rules-based order um, where certain countries, the Quad countries, other like-minded countries, even extra regional powers such as the European Union, the UK, um, uh, France, <coughs> Germany, um, they sort of they, they step in to uphold a largely commonly agreed set of shared values, um, democracy, human rights, free, fair and transparent trade and everything. Um, but of course, you know, these, the, these supposedly universal values um, are, are not shared throughout the entire region. And so I think you're sort of seeing, you know, where these, the, you know, um, those that share those values um, and those that, that don't or, you know, question the rules, who has the right to set the rules, you're seeing sort of friction between those, the, those two kind of coalesce, coalescing values and interests interest um, based blocks um, also um, you know in terms of sort of you know again I think you know alliances really kind of kind of came out um, throughout uh, the the, the discussants uh, points um, certainly while the quad has some, um, some some weak spots if we narrow it down to Australia Japan and the United States there are almost no weak spots at all um, they're much more minimal and so these three countries they they actually cooperate through the trilateral strategic dialogue. And because of um, the fact that both Tokyo and Canberra are treaty allies of the United States, but now have one of the strongest forms of strategic partnership and security cooperation that we've, we've witnessed on the strategic partnership model, you've really got, and then, then you put it together in the trilateral strategic dialogue, you've got a very, very strong kind of triangular core to that broader US hub and spoke system of which, of course, South Korea is a part and, and others, and this kind of effort to build this networked architecture that brings in other partners such as India and Singapore and everything. Um, so, I mean, I think that's part of the US kind of grand strategy for the region. And uh, while there's obviously caveats, um, you know, I think this, you know, this is is a fairly robust um, stance. As well, of course, you know, the idea that the Indo-Pacific concept and the strategy and the FOIP and everything is certainly puts the accent on maritime elements. And so in this sense, um, you know, when these countries say you know, they're not out to encircle China, I mean, um, whether China takes them at their word or not, that's a, that's a different matter. But it's not about, um, it's not about um, sort of, um, sort of moving in and concentrating and pressuring China, but rather just sort of, you know, um, defending the maritime commons and, uh, you know, and, and attending to, you know, regional maritime security issues, some of which, of course, have been exacerbated by recent actions in the, the South China Sea. And just very, very last point, um, I actually just, because we've been talking about this whole um, DPRK uh, PRC alliance, but then I sort of noticed that... Um, that um, that um, Dr. Dr. Lee Nan is now actually calling it a strategic partnership. Now I'm a little bit confused about this, and I wonder if we could get some clarity on this because um, certainly I think the general understanding is that there is an, uh, an alliance, including a defence treaty, which is the fundamental aspect of, of of any formal military alliance between Pyongyang and Beijing. Now, of course. 
I'm quite aware that uh, Beijing is trying to sort of walk back a little bit and sort of soften, you know, just how strong that guarantee would be and how absolutely binding it is, and that's always part of alliances. But I certainly think that that distinguishes it from... Um, from uh, your descriptor as a strategic partnership, because uh, just check the list of strategic partnerships that um, that China has, and it, you know, I mean, we certainly we could say that the DPRK um, PRC alliance, right, uh, as I understand it, um, is absolutely qualitatively different given that military security guarantee, the fact that they fought a war together um, against opposing powers before, from, like, the PRC-Congo strategic partnership or the, the PRC-Cambodia strategic partnership. So I'm just wondering whether or not this is just sort of personal interpretation or really whether there's a change of mood and, and, and to recategorize and even downgrade um, what is widely understood to be a traditional alliance from the 1960s and put it more on a par with a sort of a more versatile, a more flexible and less binding strategic partnership. So I'm not sure if I'm trespassing by by, by throwing that question out there, but I thought that's, uh, you know, mm. terribly interesting to me and perhaps to, 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 to the rest of the panel to get some clarity on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Wilkins. Uh, now I have about four questions uh, from the audience joining us online. So let me briefly read those questions uh, to presenters. Actually, three questions are directed to Dr. Lee and one to Dr. Wilkins. Uh, the first question, uh, which is directed to Dr. Lee, uh, despite North Korea's reliance on China for its economy and regime survival, uh, you mentioned that North Korea is, st still has bargaining leverages in dealing with China. Question is, is it because North Korea believes China could not afford to lose North Korea as a strategic buffer between the United States and China? That is the first question from audience. And the on, second question from, again, from the audience uh, directed to Dr. Lee Nan is that, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, you, men you emphasized the importance of a step-by-step -step and dual-track process while pursuing the denuclearization of the DPRK. In order for this process to be peaceful and productive, I think the strategic role of China is very important. Given the lack of confidence and trust-building measures in the denuclearization effort, what do you think China can do to DPRK as well as the United States? That was the second question. And uh, this is the question directed to Dr. Wilkins. Uh, Dr. Wilkins, I agree with, your, with you. Uh, ROK is reticent and passive adherent to the Indo-Pacific concept. And oh, it, very difficult to read the handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it seems uh, South Korea's stance does not satisfy both China and the United States and also has difficulty resolving the North Korea nuclear issue. What strategic direction do you think South Korea should take in this situation? That is the question directed to you. And the last question directed to Dr. Lee is that... Uh, uh, it has been reported that uh, uh, economic cooperation between China and North Korea has substantially declined in the wake of the COVID-19, but at the same time, there was a report that the uh, uh, border between North Korea and China will be reopened in the foreseeable future. And that's, does it indicate that the economic cooperation between China and North Korea will be back to normal? If it is true, the economic cooperation between the two countries will affect the denuclearization process? That was the last question. Uh, uh, why don't you, uh, Dr. Wilkins, to respond to the question, and then uh, Dr. Lee, you can use the rest of the time. Right? Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that works well. I'm 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 fine with that. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair, for uh, for deciphering the handwritten question. <laughs> handwritten. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, 
<laughs> so uh, that's 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 old school. Um, so um, yeah, of course. I mean, I was already alluded to in my presentation. Um, middle powers, especially ones in such a um, geostrategically sensitive and confined, crowded region, the the shrimp between whales for South South Korea, uh, are, are going to face enormous pressures as these two big superpowers begin to grind up against each other in the region. Um, you know, it risks being crushed. Um, you know, by these these two big elephants. So that's the thing. You know, when 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 two elephants fight, the the grass always gets trampled. So uh, you know, so you know that's the that's the predicament, and it's always been a predicament at that sort of strategic crossroads of 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 East Asia or Northeast Asia rather. Um, you know, um, that's always been a problem for the Korean Peninsula and for for, for um, the ROK during the Cold War. So. Um, I don't have any magic solutions for the ROK, but um, I would perhaps propose one um, suggestion, which is that, um, um, that the ROK um, proactively come back um, to its, um, its very respected um, sort of uh, middle power role and its cooperation with, with other like-minded middle powers, ideally in some form of middle power concert, whereby... Um, um, Seoul reaches out to countries like Australia, um, Indonesia, India, perhaps mm, Malaysia, mm. others, um, where it can find common ground and, and that they're in a similar predicament of, of not being superpowers but not being insignificant powers, i.e. middle powers. Um, they've got enough capabilities that if they do something um, together, it can make a difference. And I think probably the way to channel that kind of middle power diplomacy and that middle power energy um, a, 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 as a concert is to really contribute um, um, uh, as these, these the, the not being superpowers, the other powers in the region, including Japan as well, which is a, a kind of quasi-middle power, to upholding this rules-based order and protecting the, you know, the protecting the the the, the rights um, and the uh, you know and the the interests and the values of all of these middle powers as a, as a common united front, and uh, you know of course um, there's very difficult um, historical um, issues between um, Seoul and Tokyo um, and the situation is not great at the moment but the you know the, the fact remains there's a great deal of commonality between these countries you know and I would really kind of hope for the day where some kind of you know um, proper reconciliation is able to uh, occur that meets the, the needs of both parties and that they can actually work closer together um, and if not in a pure bilateral context Context in a more multilateral middle power context, um, I think you know that might be a potential, uh, at least a partial solution to this this conundrum that um, South Korea faces. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wilkins. Uh, Dr. Lee. Oh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, I think I have uh, four questions. So, Professor Wilkins' question, uh, I have to take your uh, first. Mm -hmm. Actually, strategic partner. And uh, I, it's very interesting, Chinese use the strategic partner with a lot of countries. But, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the treaty between China and North Korea, and uh, there's only one sentence very important, that the one side just got uh, aggression and the other side will assist it. But if you look at the history of China and DPRK, and uh, we don't have any military exercises. This is not our lines. We've never given North Korea any weapon to North Korea. And, and that's why North Korea is very complaining about that. If you, you think you are allies, why never give China those our, us, uh, any weapons? So I, if you compare with uh, the alliance, just like you know, uh, United States and ROK, uh, China and, you, and the, the the DPRK is we never call this alliance because we, we the, the, the the definition of the lines uh, from Chinese perspective it doesn't fit in our relationship with DPRK and uh, also the strategic partner and I think this is a really flexible word to the relationship we defined with other countries. So if we think we have a common threat and the threat is really raising up, and uh, also if we think that we there's a point we can cooperate, then we can be more cooperative and uh, be more strategic operation. But if we don't think we have that common, so we can do by man ourselves. And this is so we give the other side very, very uh, more space to, to be more flexible. 
And uh, if we think we can cooperate, we can cooperate. If not, we are not. This is strategic and fit our their own strategy, uh, grand strategy. So this is why China used this word. And, if, and also we, 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 we use different uh, level for the different country. For example, China defense uh, relationship with uh, Pakistan is called the 24 hour strategic partner, means very important uh, partner. And but we never use this important word to uh, North Korea. That's, that means a strict partner uh, for North Korea, from China's perspective, still very limited. So this is a strict partner for us. And second uh, question uh, the North Korean buffer zone. And uh, actually, uh, if you ask a Chinese, so uh, North, uh, Ch North Korea is China's buffer zone. And a lot of Chinese people think it's, uh, this word is, is outdated. And because China is rising now, and, uh, and uh, so uh, we never used the North Korea as a buffer zone like before, you know, when China is weak. And uh, we still, ge geography, ge strategically, we think North Korea were very important. But uh, right now, we still think we have to redefine the, the strategic relationship with North Korea. Just as I said, uh, we, we are trying to figure out what the, what sh the strategic relation with North Korea should, like, sh should be like. And uh, so that's why uh, what I, I think a lot of Chinese people realize that the buffer zone theory should be gone. And this is uh, my answer. And uh, the China's role, I think China's role are uh, really important for the denuclearization talk. And uh, China really like to push both North Korea and the United <coughs> States to go to the table to talk. And uh, but oh, I just said the only the the, the there's some, several things China worry more about, and also China want to play the role. The the one is. Uh, how make United States make concession on the talk, and uh, China want to United States to make concession because from China's perspective, if the uh, denegotiation should go in for forward uh, step by step, then United States should make some concession that the the, the sanction or the the the, the uh, offensive weapon to Korean Peninsula should be limited. And uh, then, and the other thing is the implementation. Implementation. I just said the implementation of the agreement is more important than the making agreement. And China want to play this role. And uh, China doesn't want to see agreement like you know, a uh, six-party talk. We have the really good agreement, but they when the new government coming uh, and this. Uh, the disagreement is just throw out away. So China want to play the role for implementing the treaties. And so that's why China hope uh, when this agreement uh, achieved, then China can make some, with other countries, can make something to make these treaties still there, never changed. Or uh, even a US uh, a president, a new president coming to the, new, the, the White House, they say, still we have to focus this agreement. That is uh, what role China want to play. And uh, the, the, the trade between China and uh, North Korea, uh, I think uh, we, we can expect it after the coronavirus, the China and uh, North Korea's trade will go in back. But actually, still, there's a s several factors uh, limiting this uh, trade. For example, sanction and other ways, the, the North Korea's uh, willingness to get because they, they uh, assume China will put uh, will make large of the the trade with North Korea, but they, they, they I don't think they can uh, accept immediately. And uh, so so we, I think we will resume the trade uh, gradually, not to largely and uh, immediately. And also I think uh, uh, China will talk with North Korea how to have a serious econ economic cooperation, and uh, especially like medical uh, medical uh, equipment or this uh, coronavirus making North Korea really vulnerable on this uh, uh, public health system and uh, what kind of the uh, help assistance China can give. That is, uh, I think, for right now, for China, is more important uh, than the trade issue. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Dr. Lee, as well as Dr. Wilkins. Oh, now time is 3.02. Oh, actually, I'm very much tempted to ask many questions to use my privilege as a moderator, but at the same time, I think the very, very important, uh, the most important virtue of moderator is to finish in time. So uh, I'm not gonna ask uh, questions uh, to delay the session. I think we had a very excellent, two excellent questions. Uh, in that sense, I would like to thank two presenters for setting up the tone for the intellectually stimulating discussion. And uh, we also had a very uh, lively discussions from four discussants. Uh, I would like to thank all of them. Um, last but not the least, I would like to also thank the organizing committee of this conference and also Korean Association of International Studies for making this event successful. Uh, I would like to bring this session to an end. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>